Throughout history, human arrogance has been the cause of many disasters, one that holds a special place in my heart being the Titanic. There's just something so interesting to me about being told that what you're doing has many faults and dangers, and yet looking good and breaking records is more important to you. More often than not, it puts a lot of people's lives at risk, while at the same time boasting to be the safest thing in the world. We never seem to learn, and today we'll discuss the similar arrogance of the unsinkable ship to the fireproof theater. The story takes place in Chicago, Illinois, on November 23rd, 1903. The Iroquois Theater was opened after many delays due to workforce complications and the architect's inability to get concepts done on time. After opening, the theater was praised by many for its Renaissance structure. It was marveled by critics as an architectural perfection. Yeah. The Iroquois could hold about 1,600 patrons, with three different levels. The first level, which shared the same as the Grand Staircase in the foyer, could hold 700 seats. The second level could hold 400 seats, and the third could hold another 500 seats. The theater had one main entrance and exit, with only one staircase leading to all three levels. It was designed this way because the designer wanted every patron, no matter how cheap or expensive their tickets were, to see and be seen. I bet you can see where the problem lies. Usually a theater of this size, with separate levels and separate balconies, should have different stairways for each balcony, so that people can easily flow through the theater. But the Iroquois couldn't be changed. Even before disaster struck, the design proved to be problematic, as many patrons tried to enter and exit the theater through the same stairway they got congested in the foyer trying to get out the front doors. Despite this glaring problem, the theater claimed that it was fireproof because of its 30 various exits around the building. An editor of Fireproof Magazine took a tour around the building and informed them of some things they could do to prevent the inevitable. Things like sprinklers and fire alarms in the stage area. But once again, the suggestions were ignored and nothing was changed. The local fire captain also took a tour around the building and discovered that there was no water connection to the building, as well as no telephones and no lights around the exits. So, you know, basically fireproof. Unfortunately, there wasn't much the fire captain could do, because when he brought this to his superiors, they explained that the theater already had a fire warden, and it was out of their hands. Concerns and warnings thoroughly in place, the theater prepared to open for their matinee performance on December 30th, 1903, just a month after it opened. Audience consisting mostly of teachers and students enjoying their winter vacation packed into the theater to see the comedy musical Mr. Bluebeard. With the Chicago local in the performance, it drew a much bigger crowd than usual, with around 2,200 people in attendance that Wednesday afternoon. A sold-out show, to say the least, and even standing room was getting too crowded, forcing patrons to sit in the aisles, partially blocking the way out. Things took a turn for the worse at 3.15 p.m. when the show started its second act. As if to challenge the arrogance of the theater, it was a stage light that ignited some nearby curtains. Attempts to stamp out the flames with an old fire extinguisher proved useless. As the flames began to climb higher, the fire extinguisher would only extinguish close to the ground. The audience wasn't oblivious to the danger and began to get riled up. The local performer, Eddie Foy, attempted to calm them by telling the orchestra to keep playing as the stagehands attempted to lower the curtain, but it got stuck. Orchestras playing in the midst of danger to calm people. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? It wasn't long at all before it was all too obvious that this fire was getting out of control, and with that, the nervous audience began to get up. Unfortunately, there were no side doors in the main theater, and the curtains that were thick and heavy were ripe for people to get tangled in. To make matters even worse, the upper levels were starting to run into locked accordion gates, which also sounds familiar, put in place so that people with less expensive tickets didn't sneak down to the more expensive seats. 
Actor Foy was on the stage when the chaos began to go down, and he witnessed the rise of panic. He wrote in his memoirs that he saw in the upper levels a mad animal-like stampede, their screams, groans, and snarls, the scuffle of thousands of feet and bodies grinding against bodies, merging into a crescendo, half-wail, half-roar. Performers saw the danger that they were in and escaped at the backstage door. The people in the upper levels would soon feel the wrath of what they had done, for opening the door caused a backdraft that sent a fireball shooting back into the theater, killing many instantly. The draft did manage to blow open a couple of locked doors that people were struggling to figure out. In the upper levels, people managed to find a fire escape, but were horrified to discover that there was no ladder on the outside. Witnessing the chaos next door, workers tried to lay down platforms of wood so that they could crawl across and escape. Many patrons fell to their death. Smoke inhalation and inescapable flames caused hundreds of bodies to fall and pile up within moments. When firefighters arrived, they described it as a scene straight out of Dante's Inferno. Next door to the theater, there was a diner that was quickly converted into a morgue and hospital for those that were pulled out of the theater. Many friends and family descended upon the diner to see if their loved ones had made it out alive after word of the fire had spread across Chicago. In the end, 575 people died the day of the fire, and at least 30 more died of their injuries in the following weeks. People of Chicago were outraged and wanted to know who was to blame. Even in 1903, fire departments saw the disaster that this theater was, even at a design level. Elements that added to the probability of this happening go on and on. There was flammable scenery and props. A hatch above the stage area that was designed to let smoke out in the event of a fire was locked shut for some reason, only allowing the smoke to exit the same places the audience was trying to escape. The curtain was not tested to make sure it wasn't going to snag the way it did that afternoon. It also wasn't fireproof like they said it was. Having been made from asbestos, it was weak and flammable. The emergency exits opened inward, meaning when people panicked, they pressed up against the door and couldn't get it open. There were no exit signs. Many exits were concealed by flammable drapery or locked. Theater staff wasn't informed on what to do in an emergency situation, and in some cases, they refused to unlock the doors. There were no emergency lights, so the panic took place in a dimly lit theater. Then, once the scenery broke and fell onto the stage, the electricity went out. Iron gates and bodies blocked the route to the exits. Exit routes were also confusing. There were many decorative doors that didn't lead to actual exits. More than 200 bodies were found in a hallway that didn't even have exit doors. Then over 100 people died because there was no ladders on the outside upper-level fire exits. Many people were to blame for this. The amount of incompetence that led to this disaster almost sounds like it was built to be a death trap on purpose. I compared this to the Titanic, and with good reason. Both designers were more interested in their creation looking impressive and controlling guests rather than putting their safety first. Safety precautions were ignored by staff, and both disasters happened just shortly after their first voyage. Thanks for watching. For more true crime, true horror, and bad horror movie reviews, please consider subscribing. Game with me on Twitch. I'm actually on Twitch now every week. Follow me on Twitter, and as always, be well.